Um, and I'll try to start sharing that now. All right. Uh, so can everyone see the... Yes. All right. Awesome. Um, cool. So yeah, thanks again. And uh, I'm Nikki Forrester and uh, yeah, freelancer based in West Virginia. So I think a lot of times when people think about Appalachia, they think about this mountain range that spans from Alabama all the way up to Maine and into Canada. But when I think about Appalachia, it looks more like this to me. I see these big expansive forests and giant mountains, sometimes covered in fog and mossy forest floors and lots of lichens and all sorts of exciting plant life. I also think about all the amazing animals that live here, from these cool little newts to frog eggs <laughs> to black bears and beavers, and just the immense biodiversity that we have here. And of course, Appalachia is an amazing place to go play outside. So one of my favorite things to do is go skiing in the winter. I also love to paddle and bike and even have friends that love to fish. There's pretty much infinite outdoor opportunities and places to explore in these mountains. And I think one of the most special things about them is we get this massive change in the seasons. And so, you know, they look so different throughout the course of a single year and then year after year. But in addition to my personal love for it, I think the Appalachians are just a truly magnificent place on a global scale. Um, they're some of the oldest mountains in the world, and they really are a special place for biodiversity. Um, so I love showing this map from the Nature Conservancy. It's a migration map that looks at how birds, mammals, and vertebrates move throughout North America. And you just see Appalachia as this amazing highway for where animals are moving. <laughs> Um, and this is going to be even more important with climate change because these animals are moving both up in elevation and, you know, further north as the climate gets warmer. And so that actually inspired the Nature Conservancy to pick the Appalachian Mountains as one of the top four areas in the entire world for conserving biodiversity and fighting climate change, along with the Amazon rainforest. Kenyan grasslands and Kalimantan in, in Indonesia. So I think it just has this immense importance on a global scale as well. And so when I think about that combined with just my personal love for these landscapes and all the cool critters that occur here, oops, um, that's really what inspires me to, you know, start writing about nature and gives me tons of ideas and inspiration. <laughs> um, so a little bit about me. Uh, yeah, I studied anthropology and biology as an undergraduate and then worked in the research field for quite some time. I was a science technician and then went on to do a PhD in ecology and evolution studying alfalfa plants. And then towards the end of my PhD, um, decided that I didn't really want to stay in research and I wanted to stay in Appalachia. <laughs> um, so I started looking into science writing as a career path. Um, I did the Mass Media Fellowship in 2019 and went out to St. Louis for a summer and got to work for the newspaper there. And that just really solidified my love of journalism. And so I've been freelancing ever since. Um, so one of the, I guess, I write for a bunch of different outlets and have kind of an array of <laughs> projects as a freelancer, but uh, my biggest spot for nature writing is in Highland Outdoors. So uh, it's an outdoor adventure magazine based in West Virginia that I publish with my husband. We do all the businessy stuff, um, but the fun part is writing <laughs> all the news briefs, feature stories, personal essays, um, and Q&A profiles. Most of my stories for the magazine have some sort of nature or scientific spin to them. And then I do a lot of editing for the nature writing uh, from our contributors as well. So over the years, I've gotten to write uh, quite a few stories for Highland Outdoors that have nature themes to them. Um, we took the magazine over from the previous publisher in 2018, and my first story as owner of the magazine was about the Cheat Mountain Salamander, which is a really cool endangered salamander that occurs in West Virginia. Uh, I've also had a chance to go out with a group of people and search for hellbenders and write about it, which are these really amazing giant salamanders here. Um, 
I wrote about this ancient sloth skull that was discovered last year in a river after a flood. Uh, candy darters, which I'll talk a lot about <laughs> in the next couple slides. Um, spring ephemeral plants, mosses, red spruce restoration, which is super important for climate change adaptation. And then even a group of volunteers who have been monitoring weather patterns and snowfall um, in the place where I live, Canaan Valley, uh, just to see how climate change has impacted our snow here. So tons and tons of stories about West Virginia still to write about, but um, it's been cool to dip, dig into some of these topics. So finding stories is always a fun challenge. Um, I find stories in a variety of ways. Sometimes I'll look at news alerts or press releases just to see what's going on at the universities or you know what different governmental groups or um, nonprofits are working on. I also chat a lot with my friends here. It's a pretty small community. <laughs> and so uh, a lot of my friends work in environmental nonprofits and they'll chat about the projects they're working on and that will give us some good ideas for stories. Um, I also go to a lot of events during the summer, especially different festivals. Um, and those are a great place to meet people and just hear what people are excited about or what stories they think could be really interesting. Um, and then I also just love reading about Appalachia. So there, there are so many great writers here and um, seeing what other people choose to focus on and how they tell their stories can be really inspiring. Um, but of course, my favorite thing to do is just go spend time outside. So uh, I love hiking around and going on adventures and just seeing what things pop up uh, as I'm playing outside. <laughs> But of course, you can't write about everything that you think about. Um, so you have to narrow it down to <laughs> a few topics. Um, so when I'm thinking about, you know, all the different story ideas, at least in the context of this outdoor magazine that I publish, um, we only publish four times a year. And so I basically get the opportunity to write four features a year. Uh, so the first question I usually ask is, is this story important? Like, will it matter to the people who are reading it? Has it been covered previously by other outlets? And if so, is there a new fresh perspective I can bring to it? Did something happen that'll make it more relevant or feel new again now? Um, will it resonate with our readers in some way? You know, I really want my story to speak to them and be feel important to them. Um, and then even thinking about details like who I would talk to for the story and um, yeah, what different elements I can add to it through other people. Um, am I excited about it is a big one, because um, as you all probably know very well, writing can be really, really hard. And so oftentimes what gets you through is feeling curious and wanting to explore. And um, yeah, so I think that's important. And then just do I have the expertise and time to do the story justice? So I think one of the tough things about, you know, being a broad nature writer is that you're never really a super expert in any particular topic. And so I need time to do research and talk to people and do the fact checking. Um, and sometimes, even if I love a story idea, if I don't have time to do it, I'll put it on the back burner uh, for now. All right, so for this section, I just wanted to talk about some elements that I think about when I read a good nature story and what I think would make a good nature story. And so, um, I started with a list that I heard about from Sarah Kaplan, who's at Was the Washington Post. She talked about some of these elements during the Mass Media Fellowship, and I thought it was a super helpful way to think about, like, if I have a story idea in mind, does it hit some of these marks? Um, and then I added a bunch of my own to it as well. Um, but I think basically for me, a good nature story comes down to having a pretty clear narrative arc. Um, and some sense of conflict or tension in it, using really vivid language to capture a landscape or an organism or an environment that can really draw the reader in. Um, of course, some scientific information and facts, um, exciting characters, a relevance to the audience, you know, you want them to care about it as well. Um, my personal favorite element is this sense of wonder. <laughs> um, and then some sort of argument or key message to tie it all together. And then if we're lucky, we get some good compelling visual elements as well. Um, so I wanted to talk about these elements and kind of walk through them in the context of a story that I wrote 
for uh, Highland Outdoors about the candy darter, which is this little fish. It's like four inches long <laughs> and it is endangered in West Virginia. So it only occurs in three different watersheds here, but it's beautiful, super colorful and um, the people here really love it. And so they've kind of latched onto it as an image um, and a representation of the beauty that can be found in West Virginia. Um, so in terms of narrative, you've probably all seen the narrative arc like this before, but it basically starts out with some sort of exposition or setup. Some initial incident happens that leads to this rise in action. You hit the climax of your story, and then that works its way to a resolution and ultimately the end of your story. And so with the candy darter story, I kind of set it up talking about species diversity in Appalachia and how it can be easier to see and grasp species diversity when it's on land, but it's harder to kind of capture that underwater, um, but it's still there. <laughs> and then some background on the candy darter itself. So what it looks like, where it lives and um, what habitats it occurs in. The initial incident of this story was talking about how this is already a pretty rare and endemic species here. And then when industrialization happened, there was a lot of sedimentation that happened in the rivers and that led to some of the candy darters habitat being impacted and the species started to decline. The rising action in the story had to do with hybridization um, with the variegate darter, which is a different species um, from the candy darter, they occurred historically in separate habitats, but then the variegate darter got introduced to candy darter habitat. So they started breeding, and essentially the variegate darter is pre pretty bland looking compared to the candy darter. And so all of the color in the candy darter has started to fade away and all of the offspring that results from hybridization. And so um, because of this, the candy darter was listed as endangered in 2018. So that listing really spurred all these different conservation groups to come together in order to save the species. So it's a bunch of governmental groups, but also members of the public, um, volunteers, and people working for various nonprofits as well. And so they came up with an action plan that basically involved translocating some of the candy darters to a new habitat that was removed from the variegate darters, breeding these candy darters in captivity, and then restoring the habitat as well. And so a lot of this work is still in progress, but so far they've moved 500 fish. Um, they've released these propagated fish into the wild and so, and protected over 4,000 acres of habitat. And so um, for me, it was really the successful story of like, okay, people bound together, they wanna to protect the species and they're actually doing something to make it happen. Um, but really I decided to end the story with kind of this focus on people really taking pride in this species and wanting to protect it and what that means for really supporting conservation efforts and helping them move forward. Because everyone I talked to who works in the government <laughs> or who works on this project were basically like, it doesn't matter what we do if the public doesn't buy into it. And so the fact that they can look to the species and think about it as an emblem of their state has just been so important. Um, yeah, so um, I tried to use some vivid language throughout just to help illustrate kind of what these candy darters look like. Uh, so this is just one of my quotes from the story um, that says, with vibrant turquoise bodies interrupted by tangerine stripes, male candy darters resemble a summer sunset. Their fins fade from teal bands into elegant arrays of neon orange dots and marigold dashes. And I just wanted to try and highlight kind of how cool they look, but I think really looking at the picture is still the best way <laughs> to do this. Um, so I'm going to go into a little aside on using vivid language because I feel like that's actually one of the things that's maybe not my strongest suit, but there are just so many writers out there that do it so well. Um, and one of the things I've noticed is that a lot of them are very detailed. So um, Ross Gay has this book of delights where he talks a lot about gardening and just like little joys in nature. And uh, I love this quote from him. He says, just beyond the pear tree, already wealthy with sun blushed fruitless, is an alcove of trees, a dense black screen made by the walnuts and maples that is for these lucky weeks pierced by the lumen tummy bugs, one of which landed on my neck earlier today, crawling down my arm to my hand. 
balancing itself when I brought it closer by throwing open the bifurcated cape its wings make. <laughs> and I feel like that just transports me to that world. Like I can see this tree, the, all the trees and um, the little lightning bugs and what it's like for them to crawl on you. And so I just um, love the imagery he has there. And I think it's a great example of how to use vivid language. Uh, but sometimes it's important to not be too detailed. <laughs> so I think sometimes it's easy to get caught up wanting to write about every little detail in nature, but sometimes that can actually draw readers away from the story. And so it's important to kind of keep momentum and sometimes leave things a little open-ended. So um, in Barbara King Solver's book, Prodigal Summer, she just says, in the dark of night, every sound becomes a symphony. And I think that's just as vivid, but somehow way more open-ended and it kind of still draws the reader in, but gives them more space to imagine, you know, what that might sound like or feel like to be in that moment. Right. So bouncing back to candy darters and good elements of a nature story. Um, so scientific information is obviously a really important part of a lot of nature stories. Um, and to do that, it often involves compiling a lot of background information, doing internet searches, reading a lot of scientific papers, um, in this case, I read the Endangered Species Report um, and status for when the candy darter was listed. Uh, spent a lot of time talking to the experts and just asking their opinions. And in this process, you acquire so much information and sometimes it can be really hard to like sift through it all. Um, but I think for me, the biggest thing is to just try and remember, you know, what the key point of the story is. Does everything tie back to that and try and avoid jargon um, as must much as I can. Um, so yeah, and then characters. So for this story, I interviewed um, three different scientists for it. Uh, Chad Landris is a fisheries biologist for the Monongahela National Forest, and he provided a ton of really good background on the candy darter, the threats to its habitat, and a lot of the restoration, like habitat restoration work that they're doing. Uh, I also talked to Andrew Phipps, who's a fish fish biologist at the White Sulphur Springs National Fish Fish Hatchery. And he's done a lot of the propagation work for the candy darter. He gave some of my favorite quotes in the entire story. <laughs> um, so he was talking about the difference between this candy darter and the variegate darter. And his quote was, think Ferrari versus Ford Escort. One animal is highly specialized. It can take a curve at 130 miles an hour, no problem. And that's the candy darter. <laughs> and then he goes, then downstream, you have an animal that you can pretty much pour vegetable oil into its engine and it would run. <laughs> and that's the variegate darter. And uh, I love that quote. I think it adds such like a lightness and a humor to the story that, you know, writing about endangered species can sometimes be a little heavy. Um, so I think, care, you know, having other people in the story can really add so much like fun and complexity to the piece. Uh, and then I also spoke with Autumn Crow, who's a program director at the West Virginia Rivers Coalition. They do a ton of work on like basically monitoring stream health and holding industry accountable for not polluting our water. So she had a really good perspective to add from that. Um, and then I mentioned work by a lot of other people who were involved in this candy darter conservation team. Uh, for relevance of this story, so I think one of the perks of publishing a print magazine is it's a slow <laughs> publishing timeline. So uh, not everything I think necessarily has to have a super newsy element to it. But one thing I liked about this story is that it did have um, this more recent news of this conservation team was named a 2022 recovery champion by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So it had a little bit of relevancy in terms of the timeline. And of course, the fish occurs in West Virginia, um, in this region in blue. So it has some interest to our readers who I think like the outdoors, like fishing, and uh, who live in these regions. Um, so for the sense of wonder, I think for this, it was nice because it's such a beautiful fish. It really looks like something you would find in the tropics. And so um, the fact that it's here and just lives in these little rock crevices in three little watersheds in West Virginia and Virginia to me is pretty amazing. And so I wanted to kind of highlight that throughout the piece. And I think it's just nice to have stories of successful collaborations between scientists and the public and just seeing conservation uh, successes. You know, it can be, like I just said, easy to get kind of bumped out sometimes about <laughs> things that are happening. And so to be able to share a happy story was nice. Um, 
And of course, it's important to have an argument that kind of ties your whole story together. And so, you know, sometimes too much scientific information can be a little overwhelming for you as the writer and also for your readers. And so um, I think what can be really helpful, I think I heard this in a podcast with Ed Yong, but he said, like, basically, before you start writing, try to, like, distill your entire story idea into one sentence. And then every time you want to put a piece of information or a quote or something in there, like, ask yourself, is it helping to fill out the story that that one sentence is about or is it distracting from it? Um, it's really, I think editing is, like, one of the hardest parts of writing because <laughs> sometimes you get so excited and you get so many good quotes and you want to put it all in there. But um the best stories I've seen are ones that are just like have really clear threads from start to finish and so for me for this story I was thinking my main kind of point was the candy darter is worth saving and we can save it like there are ways that we can go about doing that and so kind of the last little bit I think about for nature stories is having some sort of visual element to it um so this was uh, an exciting story to write because we managed to get a photo from Joel Sartori from the National Geographic Photo Arc uh, to let us use while well, we paid him a lot of money, but one of his photos for this story. So um, this is a candy darter that was actually from that fish hatchery. His name is Bruce and they tricked him to going up to feed some food and Joel snapped this photo. And when I was speaking to the guy who worked at the fish hatchery, he basically said, Sometimes a photo is all it really takes to get people on board with conservation and loving a species because they see something like this and they just can't believe it's here, but they feel instantly like it's something that they have to protect. Um, so it was really nice to be able to include that photo here. Um, and then we also included this illustration of the candy darter that was done by Dave Neely, who's a fish biologist at the Tennessee Aquarium. And he does these amazingly scientifically accurate uh, drawing. So he'll measure out the fish and the fins and all the um, scales and count all the, you know, how many scales are in each row and column and draw them basically perfectly so they can be used as a scientific, um, I guess, yeah, sample. Um, but this was really what inspired the story. So I saw this illustration during one of his presentations, I guess, a little last summer. And um, I just thought, oh, this is so cool. I want to put it in the magazine and maybe I can build a story around it. And so I started digging and uh, yeah, that it worked out. <laughs> um, awesome. So um, another thing that I wanted to chat about was, so I wrote the candy darter story in third person, but I think personal observations and reflections are a really, really good way to engage a reader in your story. Um, they, you know, can provide ways to connect people to nature, even if they don't necessarily like nature on its own. Um, you know, I just think about my grandpa sometimes and he would go, why do we have to protect the salamanders? <laughs> and like, that's the kind of person that I really like to write for because I feel like through personal stories, you know, humans can relate to one another. Um, and so I just wanted to pop this Helen McDonald quote in here. She wrote about writing about nature for Literary Hub. And she says, it's not possible to write about nature without including a lot of information about yourself. Race, gender, class, and personal history will inform what you say, even if nature is supposed to be free of such concerns. And I think that's at least felt very true to me. Like as much as I try to pull myself out of a nature story, I'm inherently in it. And my perspective and my history and my experience are all going into that story, um, whether I'm you know, in it in the first person or not. And so, um, yeah, I think it's a fun, fun way to tie nature into yourself and help other people get invested in it as well. Um, so I just wanted to show some photos that I took when I wrote a story about soil science, which is something that's pretty much totally out of my wheelhouse, but I had a great time going out into the field um, with this guy, Jimmy, who's working on his master's degree. He studies soils in red spruce forests. So looking at their different characteristics, textures, colors. Um, and I think, well, my point with this slide is really like, anytime you have a chance to go out into the field with a scientist and experience things first person, I would highly recommend it because for me, it just added so much material that I could tap into when I started writing. Like I talked about our hike out into the field and getting all the sampling materials together and how heavy, 
everything was and how long it took just to dig one hole. And then we were there for hours and hours and hours and like learning on the job. And um, I think, yeah, it's just really nice to be able to have those experiences to think about when you start writing. Um, and it can be tough to get that from a phone call or a Zoom interview. <laughs> um, and of course, uh, when you're writing in first person, uh, you have to kind of choose which parts of yourself that you want to introduce to the story. So uh, Michael Pollan wrote, when you're writing in first person, you're not using your whole identity. You're choosing what is useful to your story. And I think that was important for me to think about as well. Um, so for the soil science story, you know, I went into it, kind of set up the intro, like as a kid, I loved to play in the dirt because that was really my childhood and just talked about how much joy I got from like making mud pies and uh, messing around <laughs> with my brother <laughs> getting all covered in mud. Um, but then for this story that I wrote about hellbenders and sampling for environmental DNA to see whether hellbenders occurred, I wrote uh, about it also in the first person, but from my experience as a scientist. And so this was another great opportunity to go out with these researchers. I got to see their, you know, data collection process, where they chose to do their sample sites, um, you know, what kind of data they collect. And I got to speak about how, you know, as scientists, you want to be as objective as possible and you want to, um, you know, be unbiased and you are often in the way that you approach your experiments and design uh, and collect your data and analyze it. But then as a person, you also love these landscapes and you love the animals you're studying a lot of times. And so um, kind of striking that balance between trying to do the best for science and also trying to do the best for the organisms that you're studying. <laughs> All right. Um, and then just some more general tips that I've thought about from nature writing over the years. Um, one of the things that I think has been the most important to me so I moved to West Virginia in 2018 and um, I think just listening to my community members. So I think I feel a lot of responsibility in the stories we tell through our magazine. I want them to be authentic to the people that live here and also respectful of the things that people don't necessarily want to be covered. Um, and so hearing, you know, what people like to do, what they want um, to be represented about the place that they love so much and then also the things that maybe are <laughs> a little more um, sensitive to cover just being being mindful of that and being doing my best to tell the stories that I feel like are really important to the people that live here uh, as I mentioned before I just think like reading about Appalachia is always a great way to go you can get so many ideas see how other people talk about this region and just um, find a lot of inspiration from that um, to the best of your abilities, it's great to always choose stories that you feel really passionate about. Um, if you can, I think those are the ones that always seem to resonate the most. Um, the stories that I like feel most nervous to go out into the world are usually those ones, but they seem to also get the most positive feedback from readers. Um, probably because I put a little bit of myself out there <laughs> more, um, and just write from the heart when you can. So, um, I've been fortunate to live here and enjoy so much time here. And I just try to keep that in mind as I'm writing these stories. All right. Uh, so yeah, switching gears a little bit, I'm just gonna talk about freelancing in Appalachia more generally. So I grew up in these mountains pretty much my whole life. I grew up in Virginia, went to school, grad school up in Pittsburgh, and then moved to West Virginia in 2018. And Wanting to live in the mountains in West Virginia is kind of why I went into freelance writing in the first place. Um, so I had met my husband. He's from West Virginia. He definitely wanted to stay here. And I was like, I'm not sure I want to go live anywhere, <laughs> um, which is where the research world might have taken me. And so um, I knew that I kind of wanted this region to be it for me. Um, and freelancing has really given me an opportunity to do that. So it's been a great way to not only kind of build a career based on science, but it has an impact that I feel really passionate and excited about. And the more time I spend here, the more and more I love it. So I just feel really invested in this region. I think it's 
just a stunning landscape to get to spend my days in. And it provides so much um, inspiration, not only for stories, but also like respite when I'm tired of writing. <laughs> um, so yeah, and I think there's just a lot of opportunity for storytelling in Appalachia as well. Um, it's, I think, a relatively undercovered region and it's often misrepresented. I can't tell you how many times people have come to visit me and been like, oh, I never knew West Virginia looked like this or I never knew people here were like this. And um, I think there's just infinite stories to tell to kind of write new yeah, new narratives and share new stories about this place. And I think as people who live here, we really do have unique voices for telling these stories. I think it's easy to see the authenticity um, that comes from people who live here and have a love for this place. And so for me, it's really important to try and do that. And I think, yeah, I'm grateful that there are so many opportunities to do that here. Um, so this is kind of a snapshot of my freelance career in West Virginia. Um, so as I mentioned, I have this magazine with my husband that we do that takes up a good chunk of my time um, and is something that I'm super passionate about. Uh, I also teach science communication workshops at Mountain Lake Biological Station for undergraduate researchers there in the summer. Um, and then I write a lot for nature in their career section. So that's more of like my journalism uh, side of freelancing, uh, but of course it's tough to be a freelancer just as a journalist all the time. Um, so I do some other work for the American Physiological Society, the University of Pittsburgh, and then Argonne National Laboratory as well. Um, so I really do get to cover a broad range of topics, you know, within Appalachia and beyond. And I just think that, you know, freelancing has given me a lot of opportunity to explore, to work with a lot of different people, to craft my schedule around uh, something that works really well for me. And it just gives me a lot of variety. Um, that's also really nice. Uh, and I can't talk about freelancing without talking about the perks. Um, so one of them is being able to live here. So uh, Davis, the place where I live is a town of just 600 people. <laughs> um, we're pretty much right in the mountains. So I can hop on my bike and hit trails from my door. <laughs> um, we're surrounded by a lot of public land. And so I just think that access for me is, has been amazing. Um, it's also a very vibrant community. So, you know, everyone's always hanging out pretty much every night of the week. It's hard to find a low time, but I think in, overall, that's a good problem to have. <laughs> um, and that is, I kind of hinted at before, you know, this region is really super resilient, I think, to the impacts of climate change, but it's also vulnerable. And so we're at this point in time where we can just make such an impact by telling these stories, you know, by helping people put climate change on the map, talking about not only the threats, but also the opportunities that are here to really protect these landscapes that are so important on a global scale for climate change. Um, and I just think about my friend, Mora, who is in this little pink car here having the time of her life, but uh, we were having coffee just a couple of weeks ago and she was talking about, she moved to West Virginia about 20 years ago, I think, and just talked about how this state, but I think it applies to Appalachia more broadly, really has a way of kind of shaping you. It gets into your skin a little bit um, and kind of, for me at least, brings out a much better person uh, than the person I was when I moved here. And so I think there's just a lot of joy and reward that's come to my life from investing and in being a writer based in Appalachia. And I'm excited for the career ahead, <laughs> which I'm sure will be full of other exciting adventures. Um, so with that, a big thank you to inviting me here uh, to get to chat about the things I and places I love most and share lots of pretty pictures from my favorite photographers in state. <laughs> so thank you. And uh, yeah, happy to take questions and chat about anything. Yeah, thank you so much. And everyone feel free to just Chime in, ask your questions, or type in the chat and can help to raise the question. But just generally, I think Nikki, your like uh, experience in professional, like professional writing, and it's a very unique combination of that kind of writing career and lifestyle. And particularly your last few slides make me wonder. Like, I need to jump into that kind of 
area and then I jump in the, in the nature and still have a career that, that sounds great so thank you yeah. so much thank you <laughs> yeah there's certain drawbacks for sure <laughs> yeah. I think being a little more isolated but mm -hmm. um, the overall at least for me it's been a positive place to be <laughs> that's great okay so I can start from asking and feel free to jump in and there are so many questions pop on mine, actually. And particularly, you share a lot of story about Candy Daughter. I think that's a really great example. As far as for me, I did not know that kind of species exist as of today. So thanks for sharing that. So I'm kind of really interested in how did they get started? Because when you start writing your story, you sometimes you start from the paper, sometimes you start from the Mm -hmm. and then you also mentioned the character, the scientist, the community member. How does this get started? How did you, how did you get the story? That's a good question. Um, I think I started by, um, I think one of, well, one of the kind of tricky things is that West Virginia is so small that I'm friends with a lot of the people who work in a lot of these governmental organizations. So I think it started with Chad talking to him about the candy darters. So I'd seen that illustration and I was like, oh, it'd be cool to write about the candy darter, but I don't really know if the story's there. Um, so I reached out to Chad and was like, hey, I'm thinking about writing about this. Are there big like conservation things happening um, You know, with the candy darter? And that's when he was like, oh yes, we've got this team together. We're doing all this stuff. So then, um, he and he recommended I reach out to Andrew Phipps and uh, Autumn Crow and some of these other people. So that's how I got recommended to the other sources. So I kind of started with that, just talking to them, doing those interviews, and then did all the scientific and like research kind of next. And so I think a lot of times I'll like ask during the interviews some of the basic stuff about candy darters, just to, or like any species I'm studying to make sure that I'm on the right track. Um, and sometimes they'll give really good quotes that are good to include for background information anyways. Um, and then I'll kind of try to fact check, check them by doing my own research afterwards. Um, so yeah, then I started reading a lot about candy darters, digging into some of the endangered species status reports. I read some of those papers, looked at their distribution, um, and kind of filled in the story. And then usually I make a pretty big outline with like, all the information that I have just kind of in different chunks based on what I think the flow of the story is going to look like in the different sections of it. Um, and then I use that outline to write from often, my outlines will often be like twice as many words as those that end up in the actual story, <laughs> sometimes more, but I like having it all in one place to kind of be able to edit as I'm writing instead of being like, oh, where's that piece of information and then have to go digging for it. So um, yeah, that's kind of how it is. <laughs> that's awesome. Okay. We have a couple of questions in the chat, so I'll just start from the first. So uh, Easy asks, what kind of freelance writing have you done for Oregon? How do you pitch differ? Pitch, mm -hmm. How do your pitches differ from the National Lab as opposed to magazine like Nature? Yeah, this is right. Different broad yeah, category. That's a great question. So for Oregon, I do kind of a mix of things. I write a lot of their like PR stories. Um, so like they'll send me a paper and a press or yeah, sometimes a press release and then I'll have to write a story up about that. Um, or like I'm working on a series now where it's basically just profiling different people at the institution. So someone who works, you know, actually one of the cool ones I'm working on now is this, he manages um, basically it's the spectroscopy facility, but he's also like a sculpture artist <laughs> part-time. Um, so that was kind of fun to write. Um, so just kind of different stories from them. They assign me everything. So they basically email me and are like, do you want to take this story on? Yes or no. Um, so I don't have to pitch, which is nice. Um, but oftentimes their timelines are really fast. So they expect you to basically turn around a story in three weeks. And so a lot of times I'll just say no, because I don't have capacity for it. Um, nature, I love working with them. I, that was actually my start in freelance writing. So I had a friend who was in grad school and she was trying to start up as a freelance writer. And she introduced me to an editor at nature that I still work with. <laughs> um, that was like, gosh, almost 
10 years ago now, um, or eight years ago. Um, so in the beginning, I would write out pretty like, well, you know, research full on pitches to send to him, um, to varying success, but we've been working together for so long now that usually they'll be like, do you have ideas? And I'll be like, yes. And just send a couple lines in an email and they'll say yes or no. Um, so it's, I appreciate that it's gotten easier over time because pitching is not my strong suit, despite being a freelancer. <laughs> Definitely. Thank you. Right. Um, we have another question. When you ask yourself a question like, is this a good story, important? If the answer is no, do you no longer pursue it or you have mm -hmm. it taken on differently? That's a good question. Some question. I probably drop it. Most, mostly because there's so many other things to write about. I mean, it's hard to necessarily decide whether the story is important or not, but I think for me, if I don't feel like it's, I would either need to find a way to see it, it as an important thing to write about by covering it in a different way, or um, yeah, if I don't feel like it's important, I won't be able to write strongly about it. Um, so we've had some of those where, like especially for news briefs and stuff, we'll be like, okay, this, organizations working on trying to increase access to this outdoor area, for instance, but they haven't secured access yet, or they're stuck in this, I don't know, kind of limbo land. And it's like, well, then there's not quite a story there yet. So we'll just put it on the back burner until something else pops up about it. Um, but yeah, I think there's so much, there's so much potentially to write about that I'd rather write about things that I feel are important. <laughs> Kind of back to what you say, write with your heart. Right? If you don't write, feel it, then maybe just the timing. Yeah. So could you expand on choosing when to write in first person and how to not seems overly biased? Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. That's a hard one. Um, I think it depends on the outlet for me, honestly. I think with Highland Outdoors, I have the luxury of being an editor as well as a writer for it. And so... I've just kind of given, I mean, not necessarily given up being overly biased. I think one of the lines we try to walk carefully here is that our readership is really broad. We distribute it for free. So anyone can pick up the magazine anywhere. And we distribute a lot of rest stops. And I'm always amazed by like the people that I see coming and picking it up. And so I like to keep in mind that we have a really broad audience. I don't want anything to really read politically. And I have been careful in how I speak about climate change to some extent, but always, you know, acknowledging that it's a very real thing that is impacting people here. Um, but I never want to seem, I guess, too opinionated when it comes to that kind of stuff. Um, but I think that like being willing to share my passion for the landscapes, I always want that to shine through. Um, and I think that I can do that both in first person and in third person, the way I kind of do it is by picking quotes from <laughs> the people that I talk to and trying to use them strategically to kind of relay those messages. Um, I mean, I think thankfully, another thing I forgot to mention is that like, there's this huge pride of place that I've seen in a lot of people in Appalachia. Like they really, I mean, most people that I interact with like love this place. They love these landscapes. They love the animals and organisms here. and I mean, a lot of times what people comment on most is just the photography in the magazine because <laughs> it's something that really resonates with them. So I think like I'm less concerned about being biased when it comes to expressing uh, my love for this place. Um, but we do try to walk the line of like not having too many political opinions or like we, um, I don't know, like wanting a particular outcome in some ways. Yeah. I don't know. That one's hard. <laughs> pick a side. I think that's like, don't, you don't have to pick a side, but share your, like you share your journey. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And people can choose what they want to take or not take away. Yeah. From. Mm -hmm. okay. Um. What's the best way to evaluate scientific research reports for the story you would like to write? Mm. Yeah. I would say a lot of times I look at like the journal and use the journal name as a good indicator of the quality of the science. Um, and just kind of about, I mean, I think this is when having a background in science is really 
helpful because I can kind of look through at least some of the methods and see like, does this look sound? You know, does this, did this have a big sample size or a big sample area or um, kind of looking at some of that stuff more critically, uh, even looking at some of the references in those papers and other papers that cite it. And so kind of digging into some of the more details of that, which is fun uh, when you don't have to do it all the time, <laughs> at least for me. Um, so I'd say looking at that and just seeing whether, you know, something that you read in a scientific report or research paper shows up elsewhere. So are some of the, you know, facts that I'm reading about, do other people talk about them? Or if I'm not sure, I'll ask a lot of the experts about it. So um, like either the authors themselves, you know, can you explain this method to me? Or can you explain this result to me? Or how did you get there? Or why does this matter? Um, or like, especially asking people who are outside the field, not necessarily involved in that study. Like, did you, you find this to be credible <laughs> um, that kind of stuff? So yeah, when in doubt, I think it's helpful to ask people with expertise. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Uh, we have a like a comment, and you also use that as an example with your Highline Outdoors magazines. And it's not specific a question in the chat, but I'm just wondering how was the motivation to get you started to get this on, and how how's that process look like for you? So my husband's also a writer. He was a freelance writer when we first met, uh, and also part of my inspiration because I was like, his lifestyle looks awesome. <laughs> um, but he had been writing for the magazine before uh, and the previous publisher had a full-time job and then was having another baby. And so just realized he was a little overwhelmed with having to do that. And so he offered uh, to sell Dylan and I the magazine and that was 2018. So it was before I finished my PhD and our first issue, uh, we made it through and it was a little bumpy. And then <laughs> the next one, I was designing while I was also trying to defend my dissertation. So it was very stressful <laughs> um, and kind of wild, but we've really grown it a lot over the course of the last five years. I think Dylan really had this vision for what he wanted the magazine to be before he bought it. And then uh, once we bought it, we just kind of sat down and we're like, okay, here's where we want to take it. Here's our vision. Here are the things we want to add to this business. Um, I think both of us just really share a love for telling stories about West Virginia and a real need to do that. Um, there really isn't any other outdoor adventure magazine in the state and certainly uh, none that cover it exclusively the way we do. So um, that was kind of the inspiration and yeah, it's just kind of grown from there. <laughs> I would say unexpected, but a happy thing that fell into my lap as I was looking into the next thing to do in my career. <laughs> Yeah, that's really nice. And do you just uh, write for the whole magazine content or do you also contract and find freelancer where we our audience might be interested in that? Sorry? <laughs> uh, I mean, do you, like you are the main source of the content producer or do you find other writers to help you produce articles? Yeah, we have a bunch of contributors that help us, thankfully. So um, I... I like to write pretty much just like one story, one big story per, per issue, um, which leaves room for probably at least four to six other contributors um, to write stories, which is really nice. I think, you know, getting back to that like personal perspective, everyone has a different perspective. Um, and so it's really nice to have other writers contribute their stories. I like love when people write personal essays for us about their experiences outdoors. Um, so that's been a great thing to cover or we have someone who's really into birding and she writes about birding and that those articles are always a hit because everyone loves birds <laughs> um so it's been great to work with them and then we also work with a ton of photographers so we really try to highlight a lot of the amazing photographers that we have here and we do like a photo contest every year so we have a lot of other people that you know help make it what it is great oh this is awesome all right, I think we have a few minutes and we can walk through all the questions. Um, a question about asking scientists to let you take alone for field work. <laughs> I'm afraid of getting away. Yeah, I feel that. How did you oh, I think they would love it. <laughs> and if not, then they probably wouldn't be too fun to tag along with anyway. Um, but at least I found um, the people that I've reached out to 
I think I would just say something like, I'm working on a story about this topic. Uh, you know, is it possible to, if you're doing field work, go out into the field with you for a day? I do try and like stay out of the way. Like when I was doing that soil science story, I kind of was in the background taking photos, um, asking questions when there were like lulls. I don't think we did an interview, but sometimes I don't do them in the field because they are busy. So it's nice to just either keep them really short to like five or 10 minutes and just kind of take notes as they're um, talking to me about what they're doing, but not necessarily like sitting down for a formal interview during that. Um, or I'll just ask to tag along for like a couple hours um, just to not you know, take up their whole day of work, but um, be there for enough time that I can get information. Um, but yeah, I think you can kind of couch it in a way that's like, I'd really love the experience to go out with you into the field if that's a possibility. Happy to do it in whatever way, you know, is most comfortable and convenient for you. Um, yeah, anything to kind of open the doorway for that. Or like if there's another opportunity with another scientist that you would recommend, um, that's another way to kind of hopefully you get that experience. Mm -hmm. That's a good tip. All right, final question. And this kind of, a, I think this is, is a, would, be, would be a very broad answer to that. Like how do you, would you give any advice for people curious about breaking into freelance industry? Mm. Um, it takes time. <laughs> I feel like for me, I've been doing this five years and I'm, I feel like I've kind of hit my stride in some ways, but it's been a slow growth. And I think there's still, a lot of room for me to grow and improve and figure out what I like and what I don't like and who I want to work with and who I do want to work with more. Um, and so I think the biggest thing is, you know, just taking time to think about the types of stories that you want to write, the type of impact that you want to have, the things that you're really excited to do. Um, and yeah, starting out, I think it's helpful to just try and like, try out a lot of things. <laughs> so I really um, kind of tried to put myself out there and do a bunch of different types of writing and I tried editing for a little while just to see which things I liked and I didn't like. And then um, just building a community has been so important because I think freelancing especially can be really isolating. Like you work at home, you're often on your computer for long periods of time. Um, so just being part of groups like Appalachian Science Communicators and the National Association of Science Writers and going to conferences and events and just trying to meet other people in your field um, that you can talk to, that you can get advice from. Uh, that's a great way to get going. And then there's, um, I could send this along, but I have a list of resources for like how to get into freelancing because <laughs> the National Association of Science Writers and the Open Notebook both have really good um, like essay collections for tips on how to break into the field. Um, and then I spend a lot of time like listening to the writers co-op and Jenny Gritters is a freelance business coach and she has tons of great information. So there's a lot of resources. They're just not always consolidated. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think that hopefully answers. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. All right. Thank you, Nikki, so much for all the presentation and answering the other questions. Thank you so much. And I'll stop recording before we have two small things to